The mind, one of the most complex and incredible things in the world, something that all of us use on a daily basis from tying our shoes to taking a test or something as simple as drinking water. Now, sometimes scientists want to test a mind and see how it reacts to certain stimuli or changes to better understand it. These could be tested on humans or animals alike, and these tests are called psychological experiments. Many famous psychological experiments studying human behavior have impacted our fundamental understanding of psychology. Throughout history, people have wanted to try and understand the mind, and many times put people in unethical and horrible studies to test and limit the mind. And that's what we're going to get into in this iceberg, the psychological experiments. Now, I know this has been done a few times before, but it's very interesting and there's different icebergs out there to cover. So I'll be covering this one that's not copying anyone and touching on new information. Anyways, I'm really excited to cover this and make this video. So let's just get into it. And actually, before we get into the video, consider subscribing to the channel. It's my goal to be at 100,000 subscribers before the end of the year, and it's free to subscribe, and it really helps me out. Anyways, let's get into the video. Alright, just getting right into the iceberg, starting off with tier 1 and the first entry being Pavlov's dog experiment. Ivan Pavlov, a Russian psychologist, conducted groundbreaking research in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. His most famous experiment involved studying the salivary response of dogs. Pavlov initially intended to investigate the digestive processes of dogs, but he noticed that the dogs began to salivate not only in response to the food, but also to the lab assistant who fed them and even the sound of footsteps. This observation led him to explore the phenomena of classical conditioning. In his classical conditioning experiment, Pavlov used a bell as a neutral stimulus. The sequence of events in the experiment is as follows. Before conditioning, the unconditioned stimulus is food, and the conditioned response is the dog's natural response of salivating to the presence of food. During conditioning, Pavlov paired the neutral stimulus, which was a bell, with the presentation of food. Over repeated trials, the dogs learned to associate the bell with the rival of food, and after the conditioning. Eventually, the bell alone, without the presentation of food, would elicit the conditioned response of salivation. The dogs had learned to associate the bell with the food, and the sound of the bell alone became sufficient to trigger the salivary response. This experiment demonstrated how a neutral stimulus could be a conditioned stimulus through repeated association with an unconditioned stimulus, leading to a conditioned response. Pavlov's work laid the foundation for the study of classical conditioning, which has since become a fundamental concept in psychology and behaviorism. Piaget Glass Experiment John Piaget's work in the field of developmental psychology, particularly his theory of cognitive development, has had a profound impact on our understanding of how children learn and acquire knowledge. One of the key concepts in Piaget's theory is conservation. In Piaget's classic conservation experiments, researchers would present children with scenarios involving changes in the physical appearance of objects, such as the amount of liquid in a glass or the arrangement of objects in a row. The goal was to observe how children at different stages of development understood and reacted to these changes. For instance, in the liquid quantity conservation task mentioned earlier, a child might witness the transfer of liquid from a short, wide glass to a tall, narrow glass. The question posed to the child would be then whether the amount of liquid has changed. Piaget observed that younger children are often more focused on the perceptual aspects of the transformation, believing that a change in appearance equated to the change in quantity. As children progressed through Piaget's stages of cognitive development, they became more capable of understanding that certain properties, like the amount of liquid, could remain constant despite changes in the direct appearance. They demonstrated that children actively construct their understanding of the world through interactions with their environment and that their cognitive abilities evolve in a systematic way as they grow older. While the specific examples and experiments may not be universally named, the broader theme of investigating how children conceptualize and understand understand fundamental properties of objects like quantity has been part and in integral in Piaget's contributions to developmental psychology. Skinner's Box 
B. F. Skinner was a prominent psychologist known for his work in operant conditioning, a type of learning in which behavior is strengthened or weakened by consequences. The Skinner box, also known as an operant conditioning chamber, is a controlled environment in which researchers can study animal behavior, particularly the behavior of rats or pigeons. In response to different stimuli, the Skinner box usually contains a lever or button that the animal can press to receive a reward, such as food. The apparatus allows researchers to manipulate variables like reinforced schedules, timing, and types of rewards to understand how these factors influence the learning and behavior of the animals. Skinner's work emphasized the importance of consequences in shaping behaviors. Through his experiments with the Skinner box, he demonstrated principles such as positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment, which have had a significant impact on the field of psychology and our understanding of behavior. Ash Conformity Experiments The Ash Conformity Experiments conducted by psychologist Solomon Ash in the 1950s were a series of studies investigating the influence of social pressure from a majority group on individual conformity. These experiments are widely known for revealing the powerful impact of group influence on personal decision making. In the experimental setup, participants were placed in a group with several confederates, individuals working for the experimenter and following a direct script. The group was presented with a series of lines of different lengths, and participants were asked to state out loud which line matched the standard line in length. In certain trials, Confederates intentionally provided incorrect answers and choosing the wrong line, unaware that the others were Confederates. The real participant had to decide whether to conform to the incorrect majority or adhere to their own judgment. The findings of the Ash Conformity experiments were striking. A significant percentage of the participants conformed to the incorrect group answer, even when the correct answer was obvious. The level of conformity was influenced by various factors, including the size of the majority, the unanimity of the majority, and the difficulty of the task. Several factors were found to influence conformity. Larger majorities increased conformity, but only up to a certain point showing diminishing returns. The presence of even one dissenting confederate dramatically reduced the likelihood of conformity. Participants often reported conforming to avoid social discomfort or the disapproval of the group. The implications of the Ash conformity experiments are profound. They highlight the power of social pressure and the willingness of individuals to go along with the group even when their own perceptions or judgments contradict the group consensus. Sally Ann Experiments The Sally Ann Test is a classical experiment used in the developmental psychology to assess a child's ability to understand another person's perspective and personal beliefs, specifically targeting the concept of theory of the mind. In this experiment, two dolls typically named Sally and Ann are introduced to the child. Sally had a basket, and Ann had a box. The scenario unfolds with Sally placing a marble in her basket and then leaving the room. During her absence, Anne takes the marble from Sally's basket and places it into her own box. The critical question then posed to the child is, where will Sally look for her marble when she comes back? The expected responses help gauge the child's theory of mind development. A child with a well-developed theory of mind would understand that Sally is unaware of the marble's relocation and would therefore look for it in her own basket. On the other hand, younger children or those who have not developed a theory of mind might incorrectly answer that Sally will look in Anne's box where the marble actually is. The Sally Ann test is significant for its implications in understanding how children attribute false beliefs to others. It serves as a tool to explore the development of the theory of mind, shedding light on the emergence of social cognition and perspective-taking abilities as children grow older. Marshmallow Experiment The Marshmallow Experiment, conducted by psychologist Walter Michel in the 1960s, is a renowned study in psychology exploring self-control and delayed gratification in children. The experiment provides insights into the development of executive function and its potential long-term implications. In the experimental setup, children, typically around 4 years old, were placed individually into a room with a single marshmallow on a table. They were given a choice eat the marshmallow immediately, or wait for a short period. 
usually about 15 minutes, and receive an additional marshmallow as a reward. The focus of the study was on observing how long each child could resist the temptation to eat the single marshmallow on the table. Some children demonstrated the ability to delay gratification and wait for the second marshmallow, while others succumbed to the immediate reward. Subsequent follow-up studies conducted by Michelle and his colleagues aimed to assess how the children's ability to delay gratification correlated with various life outcomes. The findings suggested that those who exhibited better self-control in the experiment tended to achieve more positive life outcomes in terms of academic achievement, health, and social skills. The marshmallow experiment had had significant implications in discussions about the importance of self-control and the ability to delay gratification in early childhood. The Halo Effect Experiments the halo effect refers to a cognitive bias where our overall impression of a person's influences how we feel and think about their character. This bias can lead us to make judgments about specific qualities based on our general impression on the individual. One notable experiment often associated with the halo effect was conducted by psychologist Edward Thorndike during World War I. Thorndike asked commanding officers to rate their soldiers on various qualities. He found that ratings tended to be consistent across different traits. For instance, if a soldier was rated as friendly, they were also more likely to be rated as competent, even if competence was not directly observed. Another classic example of the halo effect is associated with a study by psychologist Solomon Ash. In one experiment, participants were shown a list of adjectives describing an individual, such as intelligent, industrious, or impulsive. When participants were later asked to evaluate the person's overall character, their judgment was significantly influenced by the positive or negative nature of the adjectives they had seen. These experiments, along with others, illustrate how an overall positive or negative impression of a person's can influence our judgment about specific traits or qualities that the person has. The halo effect has implications in various domains, including social psychology, marketing, and the workplace, where initial impressions can shape perceptions and decision-making. Alright, now on to Tier 2, starting off with MK Ultra. Project MK Ultra, commonly known just as MK Ultra or Ultra, was a covert and controversial CIA program initiated in the early 1950s and officially sanctioned until the mid 1970s. Although certain aspects may have continued beyond that time frame, the project's primary objectives were broad, encompassing the exploration and development of mind control techniques with applications ranging from behavior control to enhanced interrogation methods. The methods employed in MKUltra were diverse and often ethically questionable. Researchers delved into the use of various substances, including LSD and other hallucinogens, hypnosis, and sensory deprivation, the psychological torture techniques. One of the most infamous aspects involved administrating LSD to unwitting subjects, including CIA employees, military personnel, and civilians, to study the drug's effects on behavior and consciousness. Experiments aimed at mind control research were essential to MK Ultra. Researchers sought to understand ways to break down and reconstruct an individual's personality, often resulting to extreme forms of psychological manipulation and torture. Many of these experiments were conducted without the knowledge or consent of the subjects, leading to severe psychological and physical consequences for some. The secrecy surrounding MK Ultra was maintained for several decades. The full extent of its activities only came to light in the 1970s during the congressional investigations, notably the Church Committee hearings. The revelation of MK Ultra's unethical experiments led to increased scrutiny and oversight of intelligence agencies, as well as changes in research ethics. MK Ultra's legacy is one of the most controversial and has contributed to ongoing discussions about the ethical implications of government experimentation, the balance between national security interests and individual rights and the need for transparency in scientific research and the government as a whole. Learned Helplessness Learned helplessness, a psychological concept coined by Martin Siegelman and Stephen Meyer in the 1960s, originates from experiments involving dogs subjected to uncontrollable and inescapable electric shocks. These dogs over time exhibited a state of passive resignation, even when presented with opportunities to escape the shocks. The concept was later applied to humans, particularly in understanding aspects of depression, suggesting that individuals experiencing repeated failure or uncontrollable negative events may develop a generalized sense of helplessness, leading to a reluctance to even take action when control is possible. 
A crucial aspect of learned helplessness is an individual's attribution style, how events are explained to themselves, a pessimistic explanatory style, attributing negative events to internal, stable, and global factors, can all contribute to the development of helplessness. Cognitive factors play a significant role, with individuals developing thought patterns that reinforce the belief that their efforts are futile and outcomes are beyond their control. Learned helplessness is associated with conditions such as depression, anxiety, and reduced motivation, hindering problem-solving skills and adaptive coping strategies. Intervention strategies often involve cognitive behavioral approaches to change malapative thought patterns and encourage a more optimistic explanatory style, building a sense of self-efficiency. The belief in one's ability to influence outcomes is a key component of overcoming learned helplessness. The concept of learned helplessness extends beyond psychology and has applications in various different fields including education, organizational psychology, and the social sciences. Recognizing and addressing learned helplessness is valuable for psychologists, educators, and mental health professionals as it provides insights into how repeated experiences of a lack of control can influence beliefs, emotions, and behaviors and really impact someone's life. Little Albert Little Albert is the pseudonym given to an 11-month-year-old infant who became the subject of a landmark experiment conducted by behaviorist John B. Watson and Rosalie Rayner in 1920. The study aimed to demonstrate the principles of classical conditioning by inducing a phobia in a child initially unafraid of the certain stimuli. In the experiment, Little Albert was exposed to a white rat a rabbit, and a dog, and other stimuli while simultaneously experiencing a loud, frightening noise produced by striking a steel bar with a hammer. The pairing of a neutral stimulus, which is the white rat, with an unconditioned stimulus, which was the loud noise, resulted in the child developing a fear response, which was an unconditioned response, not only to the white rat, but also to certain stimuli. Ethically, the Little Albert experiment has faced mass criticism for inducing emotional distress to a child without informed consent from either the child or his mother. Furthermore, there was no systematic effort to eliminate the conditioned fear response, raising ethical concerns about the long-term impact on the child's psychological well-being. For many years, Little Albert's real identity remained unknown. In 2009, historical evidence suggested that the infant was likely Douglas Merritt, although this identification is not universally accepted. Despite its ethical criticisms, the Little Albert experiment is a significant milestone in the history of psychology. It demonstrated the malleability of emotions through learned associations and influenced subsequent research in behaviorism and classical conditioning. The Facebook Experiment The Facebook Emotional Cognition Study, conducted for one week in 2012, aimed to investigate the effects of manipulating users' news feeds based on the emotions. The study involved selectively altering the emotional content seen by nearly 700,000 Facebook users within their explicit consent. During this period, some users were exposed to a higher proportion of positive posts, while others were exposed to a higher proportion of negative posts. The results of the study indicated that users who saw more positive content were more likely to produce positive posts, while users exposed to more negative content were more likely to generate negative posts. The researchers concluded that emotional states could be influenced pretty easily through the manipulation of social media content. However, the study faced immediate and widespread criticism due to the ethical concerns. Users were unaware that their news feeds were being manipulated for research purposes, raising significant questions about user privacy and the potential psychological impact of such manipulations without informed consent. The revelation of the study in 2014 sparked significant public backlash, with users expressing concerns about privacy violations and the potential manipulation of emotions without their consent. Facebook acknowledged that the study could have been better communicated and pledged to improve its research practices. This incident prompted increased scrutiny of Facebook's role in conducting social experiments on its users and underscored the importance of transparent communication and ethical consideration in research on large social media platforms. But I feel like on something like this, you, I mean, most of these, you can't really have an informed consent because you would never know it if you gave consent to the people because then they would know they're being exposed to it so they would have already an idea that they're being exposed to it so it's kind of like a halfway in my mind a halfway point where where are you supposed to be able to even find out what happens to a human mind without being unethical to a certain extent
I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. The Mother Experiments The Monkey Mother Experiment, conducted by psychologist Harry Harlow in the mid-20th century, aimed to explore the nature of attachment and the significance of a mother-infant bonding. In this series of experiments, infant redis monkeys were separated from their biological mothers shortly after birth. Harlow provided the infants with two surrogate mothers, one made of wire mesh that dispensed food and another covered in soft cloth that offered comfort but no nourishment. Contrary to prevailing behaviorist theories, which emphasized the importance of nourishment and reinforcement, Harlow's findings were groundbreaking. The baby monkeys consistently spent significantly more time with their cloth mother, highlighting the critical role of comfort and emotional support in the formation of attachment. This challenged traditional views and laid the foundation for a deeper understanding of the emotional needs for infants, in addition to studying attachment. Harlow also investigated the effects of maternal deprivation by isolating infant monkeys from any mother figure. This led to severe emotional disturbances and social problems, underscoring the pivotal role of maternal care in emotional development and how important it is for infants, both human and monkey. The Milgram Experiments, conducted by psychologist Stanley Milgram in the early 1960s, constitute a series of influential studies designed to explore the dynamics of obedience to authority figures, driven by the question of how ordinary individuals could be led to commit acts against their own moral beliefs. Milgram set out to investigate the extent to which people would comply with authority. In this experimental setup, participants were recruited under the pretense of a study on learning and memory. They were assigned the role of a teacher in the learning task with the confederate playing the role of the learner. The study involved administrating what participants believed to be increasingly severe electric shocks for incorrect answers, despite signs of distress and discomfort expressed by the learner. A substantial number of participants continued to administer shocks when instructed to do so by the experimenter. Some participants even proceeded to do the highest shock level, despite the apparent anguish of the learner. It's crucial to note that no actual shocks were delivered and the reactions were staged. The Milgram experiments sparked ethical concerns due to the psychological stress placed on the participants. However, Milgram defended the use of deception, arguing that the insights gained into human behavior and obedience justified the ethical compromises. The findings of the Milgram experiments highlighted the potential influence of authority figures in shaping human behavior. The studies demonstrated the capacity of individuals to carry out actions against their own moral judgments when directed by an authority figure. The experiments continue to be influential in psychology, contributing to our understanding of obedience, conformity, and the complexities of moral decision making. All right, now on to tier three, starting off with the Serletti's experiments. Serletti's experiments are closely tied to the development of electroconclusive therapy, a psychiatric treatment involving the induction of seizures in patients for therapeutic purposes. In the 1930s, Italian neurologist Hugo Serletti and his colleague Lucio Bini conducted experiments motivated by a desire to find an effective and humane treatment for severe metal, mental disorders, including conditions like schizophrenia and severe depression. The foundation of their work lay in the observation that individuals experiencing seizures due to various medical conditions often exhibited an improvement in psychiatric symptoms. Building on this observation, Sarletti and Binney explored the induction of seizures as a potential therapeutic intervention. In 1938, they conducted experiments using electric shocks to induce seizures in dogs, redefining their technique over time. This marked the development of electroconclusive therapy. Initially met with skepticism, ECT gained acceptance as a psychiatric treatment over subsequent decades. It was particularly utilized for severe cases of mood disorders and schizophrenia when other interventions proved ineffective. Ethical concerns were raised regarding the use of ECT. But ongoing efforts have been made to redefine and standardize the procedure and address associated ethical considerations. While ECT is actually still employed today, contemporary practices involve modified techniques and the use of anesthesia to minimize discomfort for the patients. The treatment is typically reserved for cases where other therapeutic approaches have not yielded successful outcomes. So Letty's experiments and the subsequent development of ECT represent a significant chapter in the history of psychiatric interventions. Three Identical Strangers Three Identical Strangers is a documentary that delves into the lives of triplets, Body Shafran, Eddie Galland, and David Kelman. 
who were all separated at birth and reunited in their late teens. Their chance discovery of each other in 1980 at the age of 19 led to media attention and instant celebrity status as they navigated the unique experience of newfound brotherhood. The documentary reveals a troubling aspect of their story. The triplets were unknowingly part of a secret study conducted by the Lewis Wise Services Adoption Agency in collaboration with psychologist Peter Naber. This idea and study aim to investigate the influence of nature versus nurture on child development. The study's design involved deliberately separating identical siblings and placing them in families with different socioeconomic backgrounds without the knowledge or consent of the adoptive families. The methods employed in the study, as highlighted in the documentary, raise ethical concerns about the well-being of the participants. The triplets' lives were significantly impacted by the separation, and the documentary explores the lasting psychological effects on their relationships and their mental health. Three identical strangers brought attention to the controversial and unethical nature of the study as a whole, prompting discussions about the ethical considerations in research involving human subjects. The lack of informed consent and the intentional separation of identical siblings underscore the importance of transparency and ethical conduct in scientific investigations, especially with dealing with vulnerable populations such as adopted children. Rosenhan Experiment the Rosenhan experiment, conducted by psychologist David Rosenhan in 1973, was a groundbreaking study that brought attention to serious issues in the diagnosis and the treatment of mental illness within psychiatric institutions. The primary objective was to investigate the reliability of psychiatric diagnoses and the potential for individuals without genuine mental issues to be mislabeled and mistreated within such settings. Rosenhan and seven other pseudo-patients orchestrated this experiment by foreigning auditory hallucination to gain admission by various psychiatric hospitals. Despite subsequently behaving normally and truthfully, reporting the sensation of hallucinations, all pseudo-patients were diagnosed with psychiatric disorders, including labels like schizophrenia, indicating a significant flaw in the diagnosis process. Once admitted, the pseudo-patients engaged in normal activities, took prescribed psychotropic medications, and endeavored to convince the staff of their readiness for release. Normal behaviors such as taking notes on their surroundings were often misinterpreted as symptoms of their supposed disorders. The average duration of the hospitalization for the pseudo-patients was 19 days, with individual lengths ranging from 7 to 52, and they were really just regular people without any real diagnoses. Upon release, they were diagnosed with schizophrenia in remission, raising concerns about the validity and the permanence of psychiatric diagnoses. The study revealed that both staff and other patients failed to identify the pseudo-patients as imposters, highlighting the challenges of distinguishing between normal behavior and symptoms within psychiatric settings. The ethical implications of the Rosenhan experiments were significant, as it involved deception and raised concerns about the potential harm caused by misdiagnoses and mistreatment, but I think this experiment really didn't have that much ethical considerations, to be honest, because it just goes to show that most of the psychiatric institutions were just mislabeling people and giving them incorrect medications and stuff like that, which is a lot worse than whatever the pseudo patients did. Jane Elliott's School Class Jane Elliott's school class experiment, commonly known as the Blue Eyes slash the Brown Eyes exercise, took place in the aftermath of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in the 1968. In this groundbreaking experiment, Elliott, an educator, divided her third grade class based on eye color, designating one group as blue-eyed and the other as brown-eyed. The exercise aimed to teach the students about racism, discrimination, and the profound impact of prejudice on individuals and society. During the exercise, Elliot treated the two groups very differently, giving privileges to one and subjecting the other to discrimination. The students directly experienced the emotional and psychological toll of prejudice, fostering empathy and understanding. The experience prompted discussions among the students about their feelings and reactions about being discriminated against or favored based on arbitrary characteristics like eye color. 
Alright, now on to tier 4, bystander effect experiments. The bystander effect, a social phenomena where individuals are less likely to intervene in emergency situations when others are present, has been studied through several key experiments. While the Kitty Jenniverse case in 1964 is often associated with the bystander effect, it is not an experiment in itself, but contributed to the exploration of the psychological phenomenon. The case involved witnesses failing to intervene or contact the police during a murder. In 1968, psychologists John Darley and Bib Latane conducted a series of experiments to investigate bystander behavior. One experiment involved participants discussing personal problems via an intercom with some individuals faking seizures. The presence of making more potential helpers led to slower response times and a decreased likelihood of assistance. So, the more people around caused less people to try to help out with the people faking the seizures. Another experiment, Darley and Latane, in 1970 placed participants in a smoke-filled room. When individuals believed they were alone, they promptly reported the smoke. However, in the presence of passive others who did not react, participants were slower to respond and less likely to take action. The Lost Letter Experiment in 1971 by Philip Zimbardo and John Darley involved dropping stamped and addressed letters in public places to observe if strangers would mail them. The presence of other people decreased the likelihood that the dropped letters would be mailed, illustrating the diffusion of responsibility. In the Subway Samaritan Experiment in 1973, conducted by John Darley and Daniel Botson, participants on a New York subway were more likely to help a person in distress when they believed they were the only witness. When multiple bystanders were present, the likelihood of assistance decreased. Collectively, these experiments and highlight the impact of social factors, such as the number of bystanders and the diffusion of responsibility on help and behavior. The bystander effect remains a crucial topic in social psychology, contributing to our understanding of how individuals respond to emergencies in the presence of others and influencing efforts to promote pro-social behavior. The Third Wave The Third Wave was an experiment conducted by high school teacher Ron Jones in 1967 at Kubli High School in Palo Alto, California, motivated by student inquiries about the factors leading to the support of authoritarian regimes. Jones initiated the experiment to explore the dynamics of social conformity and the potential for authoritarianism to emerge in a democratic society. In the experiment, Jones induced and introduced a strict set of rules and established a disciplined environment, forming a pseudo-movement known as the Third Wave. Students were required to adhere to the rules and participate in the symbols and rituals, including a salute reminiscent of the German salute during World War II. Can't say the real word or the regime but you'd probably know what I'm talking about. The experiment aimed to illustrate how easily individuals could be influenced to conform to authority and the appeal of fascist ideologies. Remarkably, the third wave demonstrated rapid spread of conformity among students. Many willingly embraced the authoritarian structure, finding a sense of belonging and purpose within the group. The experiment's intensity surpassed June's expectation, with students reporting feelings of empowerment and superiority over those outside the group. Recognizing the potential dangers of the experiment and the emergence of authority, authoritarian tendencies, Jones abruptly terminated the third wave on the fifth day, so it only took five days to basically start a new regime. He used the experience as a teaching moment to discuss the dangers of unquestioning obedience and authority and the critical importance of independent thinking. The third wave had a profound impact on both Ron Jones and the students involved. The experiment served as a powerful lesson about the potential for authoritarianism to surface in any social context and underscore the importance of vigilance against conformity and blind obedience. Jones later documented the events in an article titled The Third Wave and authored a book, The Wave, reflecting on an experiment and its enduring lessons. The Good Samaritan Experiment The Good Samaritan Experiment, conducted by psychologists John Darley and Daniel Batson in 1973, aimed to investigate the influence of situational factors on helping behavior, particularly in the context of religious beliefs and the biblical story of the Good Samaritan. The study focused on seminary students, individuals in training to become priests, to explore whether their commitment to compassion and empathy would impact their likelihood of offering assistance. In this experimental design, participants were asked to prepare a talk on various topics, including the parable of the Good Samaritan. The critical manipulation involved informing some participants that they were already late for their scheduled talk. 
creating a sense of time pressure. Others were told that they had ample time to spare. This manipulation was designed to mimic real-world scenarios where individuals might be in a hurry. As the seminary students went to deliver their talks, they encountered a person in apparent distress in the alley. Unbeknownst to them, the person was a confederate of the resources. The study aimed to assess whether the level of time and the pressure would influence the participants' willingness to stop and offer assistance. The results of the Good Samaritan experiment revealed a significant impact on time pressure on helping behavior. Seminary students who believed that they were running late were less likely to stop and provide assistance, despite their training and preparation to speak on the theme of the Good Samaritan. So it's kind of a hypocrisy in a sense. This outcome underscored the powerful influence of situational factors in shaping human behavior. Even in individuals with a strong moral and religious foundation, it really didn't matter. The Bobo Doll Experiment, conducted by Albert Bandura in 1961, stands as a seminal study in psychology that sought to investigate the influence of observable learning and imitation on aggressive behavior in children. The study involved 72 preschool children, equally distributed by gender and divided into three different groups. The children were exposed to different conditions, with one group witnessing an adult model displaying aggressive behaviors towards a Bobo Doll another group observing a non-aggressive adult model, and the third group serving as a control group with no exposure to adult models at all. The aggressive adult model in the experiment demonstrated behaviors such as hitting, kicking, and verbally abusing the Bobo doll, while the non-aggressive model either ignored the doll or engaged in peaceful play with it. Following the exposure to these models, the children were individually placed in a room with toys, including a Bobo doll and their behavior was observed and recorded. The results of the experiment revealed that children who had witnessed the aggressive model were more likely to imitate the observed aggressive behaviors compared to those who observed the non-aggressive model or had no exposure to the adult models at all. Albert Banduro's Bobo Doll experiment provided empirical support for his social learning theory, emphasizing the role of observational learning, imitation, and modeling in the acquisition of new behaviors. The study significantly contributed to the understanding of how children learn, and adopt behaviors through observation. All right, now on to tier five, starting off with Monster Study. The Monster Study, conducted by Wendell Johnson and Mary Tudor at the University of Iowa in 1939, is a controversial experiment that aimed to investigate the effects of negative speech therapy on the speech development of children, also known as the Iowa Orphan Experiment. This study involved 22 orphan children from the Iowa Soldiers and Sailors Orphans Home in Davenport, divided into two groups, one labeled as stutterers, which was the experimental, and the other as non-stutterers, control in the experiment. Children in the experimental group were falsely informed that they exhibited signs of stuttering, irrespective of their actual speech abilities. These children were subjected to negative feedback about their speech, reinforcing the perception that they had a speech disorder. In contrast, the control group received regular positive feedback about their speech. The ethical concerns surrounding the monster study are substantial, as the negative labeling and feedback caused psychological harm to the children in the experimental group. Notably, the study lacked informed consent from the children or their guardians, and the potential long-term effects of the negative impact and feedback were not adequately concerned. The aftermath of the monster study revealed that some children in the experimental group developed speech problems and experienced psychological distress. The study was not widely published at the time, and its details remained largely unknown until the 1990s. In 2001, the University of Iowa issued a public apology for the monster study, acknowledging the ethical violations and the harm caused to the participants. Operation Midnight Climax was a clandestine program conducted by the CIA under the umbrella of MKUltra, a broader research initiative that we talked about earlier. Active from the late 1950s to the early 1960s, this covert operation centered around administrating psychoactive substances, particularly LSD, to unwitting individuals for the purpose of studying the effects of these substances on behavior and the mind. To facilitate these experiments, the CIA set up safe houses in New York and San Francisco, masquerading as brothels. These locations were equipped with two-way mirrors and recording devices, providing a controlled environment to observe the reactions of individuals who were unknowingly exposed to mind-altering substances. 
God, the CIA has done some messed up stuff. The primarily tactic involved luring individuals, often from marginalized communities, into these establishments without their knowledge or their consent. The substances used in Operation Midnight Climax went beyond just LSD. Encompassing various psychoactive compounds, the operation faced significant criticism for its lack of ethical considerations and the violation of individuals' rights. Obviously, the use of unweighted subjects, coupled with the potential long-term effects of the administered substances, raised serious ethical concerns. The details of MK Ultra, including Operation Midnight Climax, came to light in the 1970s. In 1974, the New York Times published an expose on the CIA's mind control experiments, leading to investigations and congressional hearings. The revelation of such covert and ethically questionable practices prompted public scrutiny and discussions about the limits of government-sponsored research and the protection of individual rights in the pursuit of national security objectives. Loretta Bender's Experiments Loretta Bender was an American psychiatrist known for her work in child psychiatry. One of the most notable aspects of her career and her involvement is the electroconclusive therapy in psychosurgery, particularly in relation to children with behavioral and emotional disorders. It's important to note that her methods and ethical standards have been widely criticized in modern context. Bender's experiments and practices involve the use of ECT, which we kind of talked about earlier, in psychosurgery on children diagnosed with various conditions, including schizophrenia. She believed that these treatments could bring about behavioral changes in children with severe mental health issues. However, her approach and the ethical standards of the time have come under scrutiny. One of the controversial aspects of Bender's work is her involvement in the use of convulsive therapy, which involves inducing seizures in patients through ECT. The administration of ECT to the children, especially without informed consent or thorough understanding of the potential long-term effects, is viewed as ethically problematic in modern psychiatric and medical practice. Bender's legacy is complex as her work was conducted during a period when psychiatric treatments and ethical considerations were different from contemporary standards. While some aspects of her research contribute to the understanding of psychiatric conditions in children during the time, her methods and the use of treatments like ECT on children are now seen as ethically questionable. The Monkey Drug Trials, conducted in the 1960s at the Addiction Research Center in Lexington, Kentucky, aimed to investigate the effects of various drugs on non-human primates, particularly monkeys. The experiments involved allowing monkeys to self-administer drugs by pressing a lever, studying their behavior and patterns of drug consumption. Drugs tested included hallucinogens, opioids, and stimulants like cocaine, morphine, LSD, and PCP. The findings provided valuable insights into the self-administration patterns of different drugs by primates, shedding light on the reinforcing effects of these substances and contributing to the understanding of drug addiction and behavior in a controlled experimental setting. However, the monkey drug trials have faced criticism for ethical reasons, of course. Concerns have been raised about the treatment of the monkeys and the ethics of inducing drug addiction in non-human primates. The experiments, along with the research at the time, influenced discussions about drug policies and addiction treatment. They played a role in shaping policies related to substance abuse and addiction, contributing to the broader understanding of drug effects on behavior and how we understand drugs today. All right, now onto the final tier of the iceberg, tier seven, starting off with project QK Hilltop. And this is again with the CIA. CIA is doing great stuff. Never. And it was a human experimental program that was used in the CIA. This project was done by the CIA, and the goal of this was to gain entrance of the human mind and manipulating it. The CIA used ancient Chinese brainwashing techniques and tried to brainwash people. And the techniques they used, such as assault on identity, saying, you are not who you think you are, and systematic attacks on someone's sense of self, and saying, you are not a person, or you are not a man, under constant attack for days, weeks, and months, just being constantly barraged by these demeaning words. Guilt and making a person feel bad and attacking constantly of sin. So just saying you're an evil person. And self-betrayal, making the person agree you are a bad person or you are not good. Once in guilt, the agent forces through physical or mental harm to say his family and friends are doing bad as well. And the breaking point, the questions of, Am I really me? Where am I? Or who am I? And undergo emotional breakdown. 
At this point, the agents make so tries to convert them to another belief system that will save them, and his sense of self is up to the agent. They don't know anything about themselves. And that's about it for Project Hilltop. My god, the CIA is just something else. And if you guys want a video on the CIA iceberg, I'll be happy to make it. Just let me know. The Aversion Project, a rehensible series of medical experiments conducted by the South African military during the Afrohead era, sought to eliminate homosexuality among military personnel through extreme and unethical means, taking place primarily in the 1970s and the 1980s. The project reflected the discriminatory policies of the apartheid government, which stigmatized and deemed homosexuality a security risk under the direction of military psychiatrists and medical personnel. Individuals identified as gay or lesbian were subjected to forced aversion therapy. This included the administration of drugs like amorphine to endorse nausea and vomiting while exposing them to homoerotic images. Electroconclusive therapy, also known as ECT, was also employed as part of these cruel and inhumane practices. One of the most egregious aspects of the aversion project involved the forced performance of sex change operations on gay individuals without their consent. This extreme measure was undertaken under the misguided belief that altering a person's gender could, quote, cure their homosexuality. The exposure of the aversion project came in the 1990s after the end of the apartheid, and this obviously led to international outrage. The re revelation of these unethical practices resulted in legal consequences for some involved medical pro professionals. In 1999, Dr. Audrey Levin, a key figure in the project, and had his medical license revoked by the South African Medical and Dental Council for unethical and unprofessional conduct. The Aversion Project remains a chilling testament to the severe human rights abuses perpetrated during the apartheid era, reflecting the extreme measures taken to enforce discriminatory policies. Project Artichoke, and once again, being administered by the CIA under the MK Ultra. God, the CIA. If you don't know already, I don't like them. Its primary objective was to enhance methods of extracting information from individuals through a variety of means, including the use of drugs, hypnosis, and psychological techniques. This initiative was part of the broader MK Ultra program, which explored the manipulation of human behavior and intelligence for military purposes during the Cold War, as we've gone over a few times already. The methods employed by Project Artichoke included the administration of mind-altering substances like LSD, scopolamine, and mescaline. The project, of course, involved human experimentation, often conducted without the knowledge or consent of the individuals subjected to these mind-altering substances. And all of these MK Ultra ones are kind of similar, but I'll still go over them. Project Artichoke was marked by the collaboration with other MK Ultra subprojects, leading to the comprehensive exploration of various avenues for manipulating human behavior. The secrecy surrounding the project, however, resulted in limited oversight and raised ethical concerns about the use of human subjects in experiments without informed consent. In the aftermath of the controversy surrounding MK Ultra, including Project Artichoke, the 1970s saw a series of revelations during congressional investigations such as the Church Committee. And the CIA, for the I don't know how many times during this video, is bad, and I would love to make a video kind of demeaning them, because I'm already on enough lifts already, and why not? add another list that i'm on but whatever that's the video that's the iceberg all completed i hope you enjoyed it i really enjoyed making this video the psychological experimentation iceberg very interesting to me and i really hope you enjoyed it as well and also like and subscribe we're getting really close to 100,000 subscribers and uh comment some videos you'd like to see in the future December is going to be a big month for the channel. I've got a lot of good videos planned, fun videos planned, just a lot of videos planned in general. And I just want to make December a big month for the channel just because I'm feeling motivated recently. These videos are really fun to make and the love and support on all the videos is really insane. So thank you guys so much for watching and turn on notifications genuinely because there's some great videos planned to come out in December and a lot of videos. So You'll have a lot of content to see, and just stay tuned for it. It's going to be great. And uh, anyways, now that that's out of the way, thank you again for watching. It really does mean the world. Love you all. Thank you for watching. And until next time, see ya.